Our mutual influence precedes the collaboration. We've had each our individual practices for decades. There's lots of points of intersection, the main one being an interest in sound in various ways. We have not only complementary set of skills, but sensibilities. So the work that results from that collaboration is kind of greater than what I would do on my own and greater than what Marla would do on her own. It's this other thing. The Glenfiddich Artist in Residence program, you're invited to travel to Scotland to live and work on the grounds of the Glenfiddich Distillery for three months. And it's quiet. You're kind of taken away from your usual life so you can really focus on work. By and large, most artist residencies are hosted by art institutions, and this is not that. It's a factory. They make whiskey. So it's a unique for us to be embedded in that kind of context. You become part of the staff, you're wearing the safety jacket, and you get to learn about the whole process of making whiskey. You can tell that people have been working there for decades, or if not generations, and that is also what is enticing as an artist to go see how a non-art institution engages with artists. So we had an idea, we had a starting point, which was the idea of examining and paying attention to the act of toasting. Usually you toast as a moment of celebration, but that celebration could be just the end of the work day, let's say, or something more momentous, but being there we were forced to translate that idea into something concrete. This exhibition has two pieces. One is a large sculptural work called Swan Song. The name derives from the fact that the two main copper objects are called swan necks. When we heard via the coppersmith, he mentioned that two of the stills in the distillery were being retired because the copper gets eroded. So after 12 years, they are removed from the distillery and replaced by new ones. We were at the right place at the right moment, talking to the right person, and then they were cut to our sizing. The main reason we were interested in them is that because they look like gramophone horns, so they evoke uh, sound in that way, and also because they're called swan necks, it was really easy to transpose that and use the term swan song. So we use the two necks as resonating containers, and there's three motors that have these copper arms that rotate, as they rotate, they hit these switches that are distributed around the table and the necks. And each time they hit a switch, they either turn on a sound or turn off a sound. So you essentially have eight switches, eight audio sources, and three rotating arms that activate or deactivate that kind of create this uh, hard to control composition. The experience in the distillery was, it was quite fascinating actually. One of the things that is important to us and really did influence how we began to explore this idea, the general idea of the toast, was to explore the sound of the place. So we were able to get in with our microphones uh, into every aspect of the distilling process from the beginning to the very end. You know, literally going into where they repaired the casks and recorded, going into the bottling floor where they're filling the bottles, 
But one of the key ones that was kind of fun to do was asking the people to meet with us and tell us a bit about you know, what it was to work there, how long they had worked there. And then we asked them to just give us some sound. And we asked them specifically to give us the highest sound they could produce and the lowest sound they could produce and to hold that sound as long as they could hold it. Uh, and that material became the basis of the chorus of the swan song in the end. of the choir. Those are the voices of the people who we recorded who worked at Glenfiddich. And the four other sets of sounds are all sounds that we collected at various locations uh, at the distillery. In Swan Song, when you have the eight sounds and they're being triggered on and off, you have this composition that is unpredictable. So there's a complexity in what you hear, but it is a piece in terms of the experience of the piece. The more time you spend with it, you, you start to be able to isolate and identify certain things. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of listening experience that prefers a longer time span. interested in seeing if I can make something mechanical and so the more we talked about the toast the more I thought about these point of contact when you make a toast when you touch your glass and for me the switching mechanism started there and then this idea of how this indeterminate element that when you have three arms two of them switching three switches and one switching two, but depending upon where it starts and when it starts, changes the composition. Not, not that this is completely unpredictable, but something that's always changing was interesting to us. There's, there's two of them, and that's not only because there's two of us, but part of the core initial idea of the toast, what is, you don't, you can't toast if you're just one. There's always at least two people. But I think that it works well on this table that, I mean, the table oftentimes is the place where a toast happens. So there's all these kind of convergence or relations back to that original idea. Sampler was really an opportunity to do a series of small sculptures. So we would get up and play with objects and have ideas with objects and it became this really fun, creative process. So one of the things that we encountered was this small, very kind of elite room where these walls of small bottles, and they're called sample bottles, and we, we were quite enchanted by their, their size and shape. Each of us on our own did different things to them. One of the early pieces that we played around with, it essentially takes two sampler bottles and it puts them cap to cap and we drilled a hole through it and inserted a, a small copper tube between the two bottles so that in one bottle is a Highland whiskey and in one bottle is a Lowland whiskey. And then over time, it's this idea that through this copper tube that connects the two, they would slowly blend. 
In the Cooperage building, which is where they repair uh, casks, it's very, very loud. And the earplugs that they use are all, uh, these kind of bright yellow and pink earplugs. And they have a dispenser just before you enter the loud area. So one of the ways that we use the sample bottles was by stuffing as many earplugs in that, the bottle. In, and they're very compacted. So the, the tidal ear pressure evoked, uh, I mean, air flight, but the, this kind of compression of, of sound inside a bottle. And I think the kind of linchpin for that particular piece was adding on the bottle cap a volume dial. In the same way that Swan Song shifts to what these objects are called Swan Next to Swan Song, the sample bottles, it was easy for us to switch to sampler, which is also a, a common instrument. I come from this way of working where the processes can be very um, reliant on um, sophisticated tools and machinery. And I think one of the things I really enjoyed about being at Glenfiddich is a lot of that was removed from us and we were kind of left in kind of this really direct dialogue with objects and materials and how they could be shaped to, to create meaning as artworks. We just really wanted to work quite immediately. Like we liked this directness with our play process. And I, I think that was really critical about the time in the residency is that this idea of materials and fabrication were really, really intimately entwined with this idea of productive, resourceful play. One of the things that surprised us at the opening in Scotland was how people, given the level of the, the noise of the opening, people were really engaging with the piece in a surprising way where they literally were, you know, inserting themselves into the copper horn. For us, that was an interesting, um, unintentional or unplanned way of engaging with it.